This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast for the 23rd of April 2019, a podcast about Apache Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anyone working with or investigating big data and advanced analytics. My name is Dave, and here is my fully snack food enabled co host, Yon. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Well, I wouldn't call it snack food when it's a ribeye. Well, okay. Multiple foods, some of which are snacky and some of which are meaty. Uh, before we go into that, uh, just a quick uh, sh- uh, mention of the DataWorks Summit DC raffle. That one has started by the time you hear this. So check my Twitter feed or check the Roaring Elephant Twitter feed at the Tubecast. There will be information there on how you can uh, make a uh, k- k- make a chance, take a chance, take a chance of getting a free ticket to the DataWorks Summit in DC. Thanks to uh, Cloudera and the DataWorks guys for, uh, for sponsoring us with a free ticket. With that out of the way, let's talk food. So we got a new interview today, and we are joined today by Chris Berg, the CEO and head chef. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> We're great. How are you? Please, please tell us who you are and why you're head chef. Well, so uh, I guess apologies to your listeners. There will be food metaphors. So uh, <laughs> if you're listening, grab a snack because uh, we're going to be talking about something called data ops. And uh, my company is Data Kitchen. And, and we've been trying to talk about this idea of data ops for uh, about five years. And so what I'll talk t- about today is really, you know, what is data ops? Why should you care? Uh, why is it relevant to data and analytics? Um, and so I'm a, uh, m- my personal background is I'm a, I'm a nerdy middle-aged white guy in Massachusetts. So <laughs> I've written a lot of code in my life. I started off as a, uh, you know, actually I started off as a teacher. I taught in Africa for two years and then I went to graduate school and studied AI back when AI wasn't cool at all. Um, and then went to work at some laboratories at NASA and, and MIT and then uh, had a daughter and thought I needed to make a lot of money and, and joined the, uh, the, the work world of uh, commercial software and managed teams and wrote software. And then about 2005, I was interested in, you know, in, in analytics. And so joined a company that did analytics um, and was the chief operating officer. So I managed people who did what we called ETL engineers. Now we call mm-hmm. data engineers, people who did, we call them analysts, which I think they're still called analysts, but really did data viz. And, and we had data science people before that term was around, we called them advanced analysts. And so mm-hmm. for many years, um, we tried to deliver analytics to the healthcare industry here in the US. And, and there's lots of different data and, and lots of different business questions. And I worked for a a physician who graduated from Harvard Medical School, who was the founder of the company. And he was, you know, really new healthcare, really new analytics. And he'd go talk to customers and come back to me with an idea and say, hey, Chris, I want this done. So I'd gather up a data scientist and a data engineer and somebody did VIN, and maybe even a software engineer. And we go in a room and whiteboard it out. And I come back to my boss saying, oh, this is awesome. We really got it. It's going to take us two weeks. And he would look at me in his sort of Harvard med- Medical School way and say, Chris, I thought that should take two hours and would, you know, shame me. And I'd walk out of that office um, with my tail between my legs. And we had, um, you know, we'd bootstrap the company. We had a bunch of customers and we had thousands of uh, users of, of our analytics. And if the data was wrong or the data was late, I would get phone calls. And, you know, angry customers would say, Chris, you got to fix this or you're out. And then we had hired a bunch of smart people and they were always reading online. And then they would come to me and say, Chris, I'm going to use this open source tool or Chris, can I try this? And so my life was pretty much, how do you go fast and and how do you not break things along the way? And then how do you let your team innovate? And so we eventually sold that company to a a West Coast company uh, model. And and then my two of my co-founders and I were were, uh, looking around about what we could do. Um, and we started to talk to different people and, and we realized that that problem that we had had as a collective sort mm-hmm. of operations team, um, yeah, is the same problem that people who do analytics every day have. And, and I'm using the term analytics pretty broadly, data mm-hmm. science, data engineering, data visualization, the whole, the whole value chain. Um, and there's a role called a chief data officer or a chief analytic officer or a data science team. Um, you know, sometimes they're all grouped together. Sometimes they're distributed, but, but they all sort of have the same problem is that people, people have an appetite that the customer has an appetite for insight and they are live in a world where they can get things shipped across, you know, across country overnight. 
And so they want insight quickly. And the amount of data, as everyone will say, and this is increasing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you deal with like lots of hungry customers and lots of new data? And of course, the chain of technology is just is coolly increasing from open source to closed source to ways and, and t techniques. And, and um, it's that, that problem that, that, that we lived with is, I think, the same problem that a lot of analytic teams have is just how do you go fast? How do you not break things? How do you innovate? Um, and so that's really the, the perspective of, of data ops is that is it's the answer. In some ways, I think data ops is the answer to that question. Uh, it's starting to sound like a bit of magic here because it's going to do everything. It's going to make things faster. It's going to stop breaking things, allow people to do whatever they want to do. <laughs> and it has snacks, so and I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it little bits of... Well, the, uh, so let's let's dig into that. So, I, you know, I guess I'm... Uh, I'm old enough to not believe in magic and, and magic beans. And so I think the, the challenge here with doing this is that it's not a thing, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. so Gartner just started to talk about data ops like six or nine months ago at the last Gartner conference. One of the analysts was saying, you know, data ops is in his infancy. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, it was exciting that there were actually 400 people in the room listening to him, but it's, it, it's a people and process change. In some ways, it's a mind shift change yep. on what you focus on. And so I'm not going to talk about how to build a better database. And, and the speed I'm talking about is not the velocity of data. I'm not talking about a better streaming solution or, mm -hmm. uh, although I think streaming is amenable to data ops principles. It's really about uh, innovation velocity, how fast you can make changes or how fast you can discover problems. Because even if you boil up the, the, uh, the highest level of analytics, I think half of all problems, maybe even half of all projects in analytics, whether they're delivering a model or data, are in some sense failing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's hard to believe, but they fail because their business customers aren't happy or there's been some error or they're delayed. And lots of different people have written this. Some people have said up to 85% are failing. And so you have this, I, I feel sometimes uh, ashamed bringing this up, but it's a huge fact that no one seems to want to talk about is that we're, we're all hard at work on something that's not really working very well. Um, we all believe that data-driven insights and fact-based decisions are important, but we're in a, a world where it's not really working well. And so uh, I'm dissatisfied with just buy another database, just buy another tool, because mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen that being on the way to solve the problem. Yeah, but the excuse you hear a lot, a lot, a lot of the time is that uh, this whole data thing is still very new. We're all still figuring out how this thing works. So of course things fail a lot. Are you saying that we're kind of behind the, over that hump now? We should have something in place on data analytics that just works. That's a good question. No, I actually I have a different perspective in mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I look at it from a manager's perspective, right? So you got a group of people who are trying to get things done. And, and I'm a, a nerdy guy. I had to learn how to manage people. I'm not incredibly charismatic, uh, which is you're, you're going to learn while listening to me. But there are people who are just natural leaders, right? And, and you want to follow them. But, but leadership in a technically complicated domain is its own distinct animal. And so people have been working together for whatever millions of years, but only in the last like 50, hundred years, have they been working together on, on basically a big machine. And so in the, you know, whatever the forties, the fifties, um, people in the sixties, uh, there was a look at how you get industries and, and machines, uh, mm -hmm. working together in factories. And so there were people like, like Deming and, and lean and total quality management. And so management in a technically complicated factory, uh, there's a bunch of principles on how you solve problems, how you reduce bottlenecks, how you improve, uh, throughput. And then in software, uh, you know, in 2001, so a bunch of, again, white guys uh, put up a manifesto on agile software development. And then mm -hmm. a few years after that, people said, well, we should really be doing DevOps mm -hmm. instead of agile. And again, it's the same. I, I look at it as the same set of ideas. Uh, and then honestly, in data and analytics, it's a technically complicated environment with a group of people working together to create something. So the same management ideas should play through. And it's not. And so what data ops is, is a reflection of how do you instantiate those agile, lean DevOps ideas into the data and analytics world. 
And so it's it's a it's a that I look at it from a a managerial change and a perspective change first. Yeah, you, now you're mentioning DevOps. Um, isn't data ops embedded into DevOps? Haven't you had this all the time already? Or is it really distinct? I, I do feel there's a distinction going on here, but can you give more clarity on where, where you move from DevOps to data ops or vice versa, or if one contains the other? Yeah, 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 that's a great question. So we actually wrote a blog post about this um, about four or five months ago. It's become our most popular blog post, like how DevOps is different to data ops. And so I guess it, it comes to like what you believe Dev, DevOps is. And there's a different terminologies on DevOps, right? Uh, the, I, I'm using DevOps in its broadest term, which means the sets of techniques and the sets of technologies that allow software teams to deliver high quality software to a product or to a website uh, in small batches with high iterations. And so the release cycles go from instead of three months or six months to three minutes or three seconds. And the number of errors goes down and the amount of automation to do that goes up. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of measurement of how you work and succeed on those kind of operational parts, those ops parts are, uh, are there. Likewise, there's a team and cultural aspect to it. Instead of your development team, throw it over the wall to the ops team. That's also part of it. So that's my sort of meaning of, of DevOps. And I think data ops is, is, is similar to that. And in fact, it's an extension of the, of the, um, the, you know, the primary difference is that it's just different people. Um, it's, okay. you know, it's not yeah. data engineers. It's not, it's not software engineers. Mm -hmm. It's focused on the data and analytic value chain. And so, um, but the principles are kind of the same. And there's a little, I think there's more statistical process control, more manufacturing, because I think ultimately analytics is a manufacturing process where data comes from, mm -hmm. yep. you know, no, one side of the sure. process goes through and goes to another. So would you say, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but should one always have a DevOps environment already ready before you look at data ops? Or can you have data ops without any DevOps? I would kind of, it feels for me that you kind of need both if you want to do data ops. Yeah, it, it's funny because, um, you know, I come from a software background and, mm -hmm. and I would go to these, I've been going and t talking about you know, data ops, even before we start to call it data ops, we call it agile analytic operations. And then we had some other dumb words for That's it too long. Uh, four <laughs> or five years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, people didn't know DevOps. They don't know the term. They don't know what it means. They don't know continuous integration. They don't know deployment. They don't know automated testing. They don't know source control or version control. And there, it's funny because our, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a nerdy guy, but there's not a lot of the sets of nerds are really not intersecting that much. So your software development people who are delivering code and apps are largely don't intersect your data and analytic nerds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we dress the same, we talk the same, we, mm -hmm. you know, watch the same movies, but um, the ideas haven't flowed as much as I'd, I'd thought. And uh, in a case in point, you know, two or three years ago, it's I've go to sort of major conferences and, you know, try to get my uh, talk about data ops. And I'd ask how many people in the audience knew what version control is. Um, and it would be less than 5%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd ask how many people do automated testing or automated deployment. And very few people would raise their hands. Um, and even down to explaining it, if I, 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 you know, I stand at a booth in a conference with a chef hat on and giving out wooden spoons as a way to advertise our company. And uh, a lot of, I, you know, if I could ascertain that they were a software development, I'd say, oh, yeah, we're just trying to do DevOps for data and analytics. And then they go, oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah. But if I said that to the 95 percent of the people in data analytics, they go, oh, I, I heard of DevOps. What's that? And it also uses all of these same concepts and even tools, right? I mean, you, you mentioned that it's not just a, a tool you install, it's also a people and a process uh, thing. But the data ops also, you have things like version control and the, the whole agile methodology also features very specifically in that, right? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And so um, that's why I see it, it, it's kind of a, it's a continuation of DevOps or it's mm -hmm. one way it's the adaptation of DevOps and agile and mm -hmm. um, statistical process control into the realm of, of data analytics and data science. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, we've sort of branded the term data ops because it sounds <laughs> not, not as catchy. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's, uh, 
That explains it. You know, and, and like any term in tech, it's going to get inflated. <laughs> like I remember when big data <laughs> meant big data, right? <laughs> you know, d- dumb disks and parallel queries. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, big data inflated to do everything in analytics and data ops is similarly being sort of abused by marketers now. Um, uh, but we, you know, we wrote a manifesto, you know, we helped write the Wikipedia article. Um, we're trying to sort of define it as a discipline um, because I think as a discipline, as a set, a job role and a set of tasks to do, if data and analytic teams pick up that discipline, they're, think, you know, sort of roses are going to fall out of the sky and things are going to be better. Um, that's the that's the view. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, talking about a pickup, I mean, if I look at people that I work with, the, my customers, my clients, the people I see at meetups, they're only just getting around to um, embracing things like DevOps and looking, at, or at least acknowledging they have to look at things like Agile. How ready is the world for something like DataOps? Well, um, it's still early. You know, I, I wish I could... Uh, uh, we have a lot of people who are interested, you know, we write a lot, we blog a lot and people are, um, interested. And so, but you know, we're not a huge company, you know, we're 5 million in recurring revenue. We bootstrapped the business. Um, and so we're kind of in it for the long term. and I'm not sure. I, I, I know the end point is people are going to, are going to apply these data ops principles. Cause I've been around the block enough that like, there's really no other solution. And, uh, you know, I go to, the vendor saying, you know, just put everything in my tool and my tool can do everything is, is just a myth. It's, there's lots of tools and even the people who bundle tools together under big data platforms or closed source, you know, SAS or mm-hmm. SAP or the Hadoop vendors, um, it, it's a multi-tool world and it's mm-hmm. multilingual, multi-code. It's just, there's just a diversity of tools and diversity of people and diversity of locations. And you've got to deal with that. Um, that, that complexity and, and your solution. And so I think data ops is going to be ultimately widely adopted. And I think, um, I just think it's a, a journey that people are on. And I, I think of it as the, uh, you know, I, when I managed software engineering teams, there was a guy uh, back in 1999, our release engineer, and Arthur was a good guy. He played the mandolin. He was fun at parties, but we all thought he wasn't as good of an engineer as the rest of us. Um, and, you know, he helped put our code on our website and release our SaaS product and did our installers and stuff like that you would do in 1999 version of software delivery. But you, you take that role and move it ahead 15 years, um, you know, or 20 years now. The DevOps role is actually the hardest to hire. It's the highest paid. Um in a software development team mm-hmm. because people have seen that uh, that role is not just about throwing stuff over the wall and get some flunky who plays the mandolin. It's actually <laughs> intrinsic to the value of your team. Yeah. And so uh, the, and the velocity of innovation that uh, putting stuff, getting feedback is so vital that it's worth it to pay, you know, someone, you know, a, a 28 year old an exorbitant amount of money just because they really know AWS and, and, and Terraform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so is there a, a, a prerequisite to enter this new world? I mean, is data ops for everybody? Do you have to be a big multinational company for this? Do you need to have uh, very large data sets? Do you have to have a, an army of data scientists or uh, who could do this? Who is this for? Well, I, I, I think of it in, in two buckets, right? So the first bucket is it's a belief structure. Do you believe in the principles? Um, and do you believe that by focusing on the ideas in data ops, it will make a difference? And so as an individual contributor, I've written a lot of code and, you know, I often write tests and I often as an individual put, the, put it in, in source control and I do some deployment automation. Um, so and the, when I write software code, I, I do... Uh, you know, I do DevOps principles. When I was a data engineer, I wouldn't dream of delivering data to my customer unless I had a whole army of automated tests that told me the data was right. I just couldn't stand to live in fear that some one of my data suppliers was going to screw me over and give me bad data. So I, I would do it. Um, and I always hated I always liked having a separate development environment than a test environment, and I'm kind of lazy like a developer, so I'd script it up. So as an individual, I think you can gain benefit. Um, 
Although there's a lot of people who do a lot of damage and do a lot, not damage, but actually do a lot of good work as an individual contributor where they put it all in. Um, but I think ultimately the way data analytics and science are moving is towards a team sport and mm -hmm. that there's people who have specialized roles. And, yeah. and, and um, in that way, I think data ops is, is really a team based um, a problem, not so much a it's it's the benefits do have for an individual hands on the keyboard. But I think it's more at least right now for when there's lots of hands and, and lots of tools and lots of data. I guess in big data terminology, it scales well. The bigger you are, the more um, benefits you get. <laughs> I, I think so. Uh, 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 perhaps, you know, I think it's because it, it, if you're an individual person who's got a data set, and you've got a business person who wants insight. Uh, it's pretty tempting just to go use your favorite tools and get insight, and then you kind of own your world, mm -hmm. right? And you can build this giant crystal castle of complexity, and you can get a lot of accolades from your business partners that you're doing a great job. And I, I've been there. I mean, I, I, I like being the hero. I like, uh, you know, I, I, I like delivering value. And the problem, that, that's good in and of itself. Um, the problem with that is when you start being the hero for a while and build your crystal castle is that you start to get a little bored because you start to deal with more mundane stuff like, oh, the data's dirty this time or uh, I have an error. I've got to figure it out or something happened in my server or they want me to change it and it's kind of boring. Uh, and so you, you build these sort of monoliths of complexity and how do you then get ex extract yourself from it? And a lot of times people just quit. They move on to the next job. Um, and then you're left with this big complex, you know, yes. <laughs> hairball that you got to deal with. <laughs> right, right. So, okay. I mean, it's emotionally, it's emotionally wonderful to, <laughs> to do things and give value to your customer. Yeah. And it is a, a little bit more mature to realize that building hairballs isn't, isn't valuable and that you really th need to think about the relationship of, of the complexity that you create in code or configuration and, and data and how that relates to its ongoing life. And, and, and you need to think about, because um, data and analytics like software is a complexity business and how the complicated pieces fit together is really important, just like in your car manufacturing line. Um, how do you get them all, to, all together? Yeah. That, that's one of the, the big um for me issues around a lot of this you know whether we're talking devops data ops devsecops you know, a lot of this there's a i suppose there's a natural um rabbit hole that people can dive down for this everything diy ending up with that sort of that hairball that that all of a sudden that person leaves and then no one else really knows how the core of it all runs. And it, it's, it, it's, it seems to me that a lot of this is also about finding some sort of balance between the tools and the technologies that, that people can use to, to enable this, but also the processes and procedures and, and, God forbid, documentation that <laughs> kind of helps helps more people than just the people that wrote it understand it. Yeah, I think I, I think you're right because I think there's there's a tendency. I look at it as heroism, like doing a lot of work mm. and, and creating a lot of things. It's it's wonderful to be a hero, and yeah. I think we're kind of moving out of the heroic age. Um, yeah. You know, whatever it is in my misbegotten youth, it's like the Iliad and be, the, the those heroic values are are wonderful. But uh, you can't have people running around stabbing each other every time there's a you know every time there's a conflict. You need some process to mediate conflicts, and you need some process to organize people and. Yep. So I think uh, in that sense, um, we, as you get uh, a little bit older in your life, it less be, your work less becomes about your own ego validation and more becomes exactly how you get stuff done in the world. And it's great to get ego validation to prove that you're, you know, a big technical studly man or woman, right? <laughs> and it's, it, that's really wonderful, right? But like you get a little older, you do it once or twice, you're like, this is the same stuff's happening. You know, okay, I'm a stud, yeah. so what? Uh, I, I, I created a mess, now I'm going to walk away yet again. Um, and how do you make it work? And then you start to manage people and you realize these, there's patterns in people's behavior uh, mm -hmm. that happen. And how do you get a group of people to do it? And how do you find the right incentives and alignments so people can, because some people are going to want to just do their job nine to five. That's valuable. Some people are going to want to realize themselves and, and that's great as well. And so I think these, um, 
sort of human ways that we get people to work together and coordinate are really important. And in software, it's sort of dev and ops. In data and analytics, it's kind of, there's a lot of dev, right? Because you may have a data science yeah. team and a centralized data warehouse team and a data governance team, and then you've got self-service analytics, and then there's multiple ops. So like dev and ops is like a nice one-to-one -one problem, uh, but I think there's a many-to-many -many problem in, in, in data ops between, you know, yeah. which version of dev and which version of ops. And so that complexity is also needs to be handled when you think about, um, you know, how you're trying to automate uh, and, and fix bottlenecks. Yeah, so that brings back to, to the question that if, let's say, okay, I'm sold, I want to go to the data ops, I want to put it uh, in my whole multinational, international company. Uh, in your opinion, in your experience, perhaps, what's the best group or person to lead something like that, to start something like that? Is that somebody from the IT department, something from management, uh, legal? I don't know. So that's a that's a that's a good question. So, um, it, well, uh, from my perspective, having a leader of a group is best because it is kind of a managerial problem. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get people to adopt principles. Yeah. And sometimes companies will say, we're being agile. And I, we hear conversations, well, hey, our IT side's got this agile thing, and we're trying to figure out how to do agile data engineering or agile data science. Could you help us? And that, that's, that's one way to, to lead change. And then, you know, the other way is to lead as an individual contributor, start doing it in your own work. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, and so bo I think both are, both are valid. Um, and I think the, you know, there's another perspective on this that we've also been trying to think about is, is, is like, where do you start? Mm -hmm. Um, and like, what's the thing? Cause if anything is how do you start and then get some value and then, sort of get a flywheel of, okay, I fixed one, one thing, this sort of, these sort of data ops principles helped. What can I, what can I go do next? Um, and so, uh, we've been thinking about again, sort of management theory. And there's this book called the goal. That's like 30 years old. We've got this guy named Goldrat wrote that's about how it's called a theory of constraints or like it, Another way forward is, is whack-a-mole with bottlenecks. Um, and so, uh, and so what, uh, one way to think about it is like that there's a lot of flow of work, right? There's flow of from your keyboard in development into production. There's a flow of work uh, from as data is going through your system to deliver a chart or graph or a data set to your, to your end customer. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a flow amongst teams and how they coordinate. And so you've got to find in that set where the actual slowness is, where's the, where's the problem and focus on that constraint or bottleneck first. Um, because the, at least if you read the management books that if you're not focusing on the bottlenecks, you're actually not helping at all. You're, it's kind of an illusion that it's, uh, I think the quote from gold rat is that if you're not working on fixing bottlenecks, it's, you're not fixing anything. It's an illusion. And, and why is that? So, um, because the slowest point in a process is where everything slows down. And so if you've got a problem in, for instance, having errors in production and your customers aren't trusting your data. Well, maybe that's the first thing you should focus on. Like, why are you getting errors? Why are you late? Why is the data wrong? Why are the customers, when you sit down and after your two weeks of work and predictive model and nice charts and graphs and nice, you spend all this time getting PowerPoint, right? They're sort of laughing at you going, ah, this data's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how can you fix that part first? Because if you're trying to, the point of being a data-driven organization is to influence people who aren't data-driven yeah. personally, who are, you know, or the business side or the customer side. And you're creating these arguments that are backed by data. And then they doubt the data because it was wrong the last three times. And they were right that it was wrong the last three times. How do you build a process that you can fix that problem first, fix that bottleneck? Because if, uh, and then, you know, another example of, uh, of a bottleneck is we talk to people and it takes them literally four months to take 10 lines of SQL or 20 lines of SQL and get it from their development environment into a live production database. And so that just seems, you know, to me particularly crazy. Um, likewise, a, another bottleneck you could start with is 
Uh, you know, a lot of people have invested in self-service tools like data prep tools like Trifacta or Paxata or Alteryx and self-service viz tools like, uh, like Tableau or Looker. And they're doing a lot of great work. And then the centralized data warehouse team, big data team is like, oh, these guys are out of control. How do you how do you get that Hatfields and McCoy that that war between the two? And then there's you know the variations of the data science team not wanting the people in the central piece. There's different variations of that coordination. And so I guess the perspective is if you want your team to do better, find a bottleneck, find a problem, and sort of take a swipe at working on that first. Because yeah, yeah. uh, the answer is not going to be. The cloud. The answer is not going to be a faster query on a database, and the answer is not going to be uh, replace your tools with uh, one tool that can rule them all. Um, that's just not that you know, and that stuff isn't. That's an illusion as well. Come on, are you saying blockchain doesn't solve all problems? <laughs> well, that does actually. You know, besides besides blockchain, then you know that's that's okay. And, and I, we're uh, yeah, we're doing a Bitcoin offering too. So you can buy some of that. <laughs> okay. No, it's seriously. Um, when you're talking about the uh, the blocker thing, it's not because those are long hanging fruits, uh, low hanging fruits, and things are easy to fix. It's because they have the most results from it, right? It's because it's the most. That's it. It's yeah. it, and it really is hard to live a result oriented life, right? That you're saying, uh, if you've got to find where the biggest leverage is, focus on the narrowest point. Focus on where it's it's most problematic because. Uh, another sort of principle in, in agility or is that you you don't know what the hell you're doing and that you need your customer feedback to, to tell you what you're doing. And um, and uh, if you can force more feedback into your system of work, get more feedback from your uh, deployed models to a website, from the charts and graphs you get to your customer, from the whatever they interact with, you can then improve the product because mostly you're going to be wrong on your guess. And the faster you find out you're wrong, um, the better everyone is. Yeah. yeah. And at, what I mean by wrong is, is you're wrong. And failing fast. Yeah. And, and failing fast and failing's okay. And yep. that's another, uh, I see another sort of cultural bottleneck in, in some organizations is, is the culture of not wanting to fail mm -hmm. or the, the shame and blame cultures that some customers have. And, yeah. and a lot of times people will build these defensive fortresses of, of organization or, or denial on when something goes wrong. And I had to, uh, I had to help a company through that. Um, you know, when it was, a uh, data errors and who screwed up. Who missed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whose fault is it? <laughs> and that's a that's a it's a tough environment to, to change. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking a bit about the, the the open mindset kind of approach, right? Where it's okay to be wrong as long as you learn from it. It's okay to say I don't know this, but I want to learn it. Yeah, or it's okay to say Yeah, I, I screwed this up. Yeah. Um, whoops. Uh, I, yeah. You know, I blew. Boss is yelling at all of us, and it was my fault because I. You know, I didn't see this condition and or I didn't check the data. Mm -hmm. And and so that is a um, and so that's a different managerial mindset, yep. too. It's like it's actually pretty easy as a manager um, to blame people and to scapegoat people. And it's when thing goes wrong, you get yelled at and you can say, oh, yeah, it's Tom over here. He screwed up. And that's all that's his fault. Yeah, it solves everything. And like then <laughs> <laughs> it's harder. And that's really this guy, you know, Deming, the yeah, yeah, yeah. industrial process control guy. So there's the, it's mostly a pro, it's mostly the system's fault, the process's fault. And it's very rarely an individual failure. Mm -hmm. um, and if you take that to heart as a manager, it actually makes your life a lot worse because <laughs> what it actually <laughs> Because it actually no, means it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> really? Because you, I mean, you don't really own anything as a manager except, you know, uh, the process that people work in. And good old Deming said, yeah, you own that. And that's mostly the problem. And so when someone screws up, you're like, well, then, okay, love your errors. You know, I have these phrases that people who work with me, I, you know, love your errors and, and, and you know, uh, what's the opportunity for improvement, which is, you know, it's another set of cliches, but uh, those things are what that attitude you need to have as a, as a manager. And then you need to, to set your team up to, to do that and, and sort of live those behaviors. And then you need to find ways to fall forward. And so one of the DevOps or data ops principles is automated testing. Yep. And so uh, 
you know, the best way to like when you screw up exactly the date is late or the date is wrong is to say yep we did it yep it's our fault yep we're going to put in a test or yep the supplier gave us bad data we're going to put in a test to protect it so it won't happen next time and that small process change i've i've seen wonderful effects in patching the relationship up between data and analytic team and their business customers being open about your failures and then proactively saying uh you know i i've got a i've got a way to solve that yeah. and so that goes into yeah i was talking with a big bank yesterday and they're just starting to put in automated data testing it's like i i, I it's just i'm so shocked that this actually <laughs> exists in the world that people are putting out gigabytes terabytes petabytes of data and they don't actually test it as it's flowing through the system to see if it's right. And I, I, I'm, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I get, how can people live this way? <laughs> um, we got used to it, I guess. Been doing it for years now. <laughs> <laughs> but like, d don't you like your Saturday mornings? Like I talked to a guy at a conference and he tells me the story. He goes, it's my kid's birthday party. I'm in the bathroom on the bathtub fixing some code because there's a data error in production. <laughs> and so it's the Saturday morning bathtub protection plan. Like we've all been there, right? We've all done this. Oh, and, like, don't you but, like not yeah. want to live this way? Like I, I yeah. still have this image in my mind of, of my wife scowling at me, you know, you big tech stud guy and you're off fixing bugs on Saturday. You should be out playing with your kids. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, I just don't want to do that anymore. Right. Uh, I mean, and yeah, uh, there's no magic. There's it's work involved in building a system that uh, as data comes in one side and it's interacting in databases and models and biz tools. Um, uh, that you prove that it's right. And it, it's work. But like you should actually check to see if it's actually working as the data is flowing through. And it's um, that level of automated testing is, uh, I think, really important. And it's kind of a bedrock principle in how you do data ops. And it's invariant of you don't have to buy any system to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different techniques to test data mm -hmm. and the artifacts that are created from the data to make sure they're there. And I, I, I can't tell you how many people have said, yeah, we were running this thing day in and day out. And then we realized for three weeks, a data supplier dropped and we didn't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, okay. Uh, gee, <laughs> maybe you could have that. checked the row count uh, <laughs> and seen that it was always increasing. That would have helped. <laughs> and, and so, uh, I, so that's the emotion is like, just don't live with that fact that you need to be a hero or you need to be fast reacting or that's the way things are. Um, you can build a framework that a system to take that burden away and put that into a software system that can tell you whether the work product that you're creating is correct or not and repeatedly run that. Um, and then it also has the duality of, it can tell you whether the data is bad or your servers are down uh, in production. But then when you take those same set of tests in development and you, uh, instead of varying the data and keeping the code fixed, you, you vary the code and fix the data, it can actually then be what software engineers call functional regression performance yep. testing. Mm -hmm. and, and that principle and the, the cloud and virtualization and a lot of techniques, infrastructure as a code make that mm -hmm. easier to do. But that one principle is like all your data and analytics is a tube, right? You pour the data on one side, you want to have a big green light that says it's, it's that stuff that's flowing through that tube is, is good. And then you want to be able to create a copy of that tube in development and then pour some test data in it and have that same green light saying, yeah, all your code's great. And that, that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Would you agree it's an iterative approach that you have? You don't have to try and uh, write all the tests from day one, but just start testing the the, the, the simple things, and when that runs, make it more complicated, make it more trustworthy, make, make it more stable. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And and I think it's um, there's uh, people who get more. There's a bit of an art in writing tests, mm -hmm. um, and there's. Uh, you can go overboard yep. and have too too much complexity, um, but you should. Everyone should have things like: uh, is the, you know, are the row counts yep. right? You know, are the tables being filled? Uh, and there's different techniques to do that. And then there's different techniques to say: are individual is the zip code right? Are if you're getting a field that's got three types in, are you actually getting three types, or did a fourth show up? Um, and that's pretty 
stuff that you can write. And it's also, you don't have to write it on every field. Um, there is a way to think about what is erroneous and get some tests in, look at the data the next time you get it, diff the data, look for variation, and you can add these things. And so the one of the ways to do it is you think about that they play hand in hand. If you can write some a set of small tests, get them in production, and then just iterate and improve upon those tests as you learn, as things go on. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's good. And the rule of thumb is, you know, I worked at Microsoft for a year in the 90s and they had one automated software test engineer for every um, developer. And that is maybe seems to be a, a, a probably too much. Um, but think of it. One girl, rule of thumb is 20 percent of your work should be some form of automated testing. And mm -hmm. that is a big number for some people. But the reality is that that forms the backbone of being able yeah. to go fast and deliver high quality, reducing errors. It's that's the backbone of reducing those bottlenecks. And if you can reduce those bottlenecks, you can get more feedback from your customer. If you can get feedback from a customer, you can stop living in the delusion that you actually know what the hell you're doing <laughs> and they can tell you what they want. And then, you know, then your Saturday mornings, you're not sitting in a bathtub fixing code. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, if you have to pick one, what's the the, 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 the most important prerequisite for a successful data of the, the deployment? People, talent, tools or mindset or anything else? Or oh, it's only mindset. Or something else we've forgotten. It, it, uh, yeah, it's it, it is it's it's an idea mm -hmm. um, first, and so can you think about the uh, the mindset? And so uh, it's you know I, I have a software company, so yeah, buy buy our software, but that's not really it. It's, it's like can you start <laughs> with the mindset and start inter introducing the principles mm -hmm. first, um, and seeing if they actually have an effect. And so write some automated tests. See if they actually catch anything before your customers get it. Yeah, yeah. And then you're like, oh, that's re really good. Have a test that stops the production line. Um, and so one perspective that we give to people is think of everything that you do in analytics as a production line, whether data comes in in batch or streaming, um, you know, whether it's real time or once a week. Uh, and as it goes through every step in the value chain from you know, data source to data lake to facts and dimensions or schema on read or whatever happens to be the favorite thing to uh, models to Kubernetes clusters to viz tools. It's, it has a journey that it's going through um, and make sure that as it goes in that journey that you're testing it at each important step and it, write some tests that say stop the production line <laughs> when the data is just wrong and see how often that happens. Because mm -hmm. it may happen very rarely, but you'll be really glad when it does. Um, and write some tests that say, this looks weird. Um, I should investigate. Because if you think it looks weird, then your business customer is going to say, hey, this looks weird. Um, and that can also help you. And so I think there's just a value in, in trying some of these things out in a way that you don't need any tool. You don't need any. You can do it with um, your ETL tool. You can do it just writing your... Uh, Python code, um, and I think that's a valuable first step for a lot of people is just, mm -hmm. just start testing and, and start looking at um, the ideas of automated testing and looking at the sort of process control charts, the shoe, shoe heart statistical parts, like is your data actually in, increasing in size? Did it break some bounds? That's another way to think of it. Mm -hmm. And we're back. Thank you very much to Chris uh, from Data Kitchen. I mean, this is only the half of the interview we did with Chris. So the second half is going to be coming out in the next topic episode. But uh, I hope you'll agree with me that that was some quality time. Indeed. Really good, uh, really good to chat to him. And of course, part two coming up in uh, two weeks time. Don't miss it. So unless you have anything else to add. So before we wrap this up, I'd like to uh, have a quick shout out to um, Milan, who's uh, reached out to me via LinkedIn and said he's been listening to the podcast for uh, uh, quite some time. Uh, he's been working Big Data Field since 2015, and he uh, just wanted to send his thanks out to uh, Jan and myself for the uh, for the podcast. He says it's been a steady source of information and fun all this time. So he he took the effort to to write a really nice message, and uh, we really appreciate all the feedback we get. So uh, yeah, if you have feedback, let us know. And then that's all the time we have for today. We hope you enjoyed this serving of bite-sized big data. We will be back next week with a new episode. Until then, please go to www.roaringelephant.org where you can find more information, including a feedback form. 
You can also follow us on Twitter using the add cast tag, and you can contact us by email to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Send us any thoughts, comments, criticisms, feedback, um, ideas for other episodes, just send it to us. Until then, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then. Bye.